Welcome back to Bad Things in History, where this week's episode is sponsored by Nobody at All. As the 1920s ended, suffering reached new and impressive levels. Political rebellion, street gangs, gulags, disasters at sea, and corruption were common features during this turbulent decade. Today, we are going to look at many of the worst and least remembered events of 1929. Let's begin with a rebellion in Mexico. The Escobar Rebellion José Gonzalo Escobar was born in Mazatlán, Mexico in 1892. He joined the military just in time to participate in the Mexican Revolution. The Mexican Revolution began in 1910 and was mostly a series of armed regional conflicts. The violence continued until 1920. Ultimately, the revolution became a defining event in the creation of modern Mexico. In 1913, Escobar followed his loyalties and joined the army of Venustiano Carranza. Carranza was a wealthy landowner and politician who wanted to overthrow the government. He would ultimately succeed and would become president of Mexico in 1917. Escobar's military career also included the Battle of Juarez. Pancho Villa was first a bandit, then a general in the Mexican Revolution. After peace was restored, he became a wanted criminal again. Much of his army was scattered after attacking the United States in 1917. But by 1919, Pancho Villa had rebuilt his forces. On June 15, 1919, he decided to take the border town of Ciudad Juarez. José Escobar was a colonel in this conflict. He was unable to defeat Pancho Villa without help, but he did succeed in keeping his men from being slaughtered during the battle. Escobar would prove his proficiency in future battles and would eventually become one of the most respected generals in Mexico, but he would not tolerate politicians who abused their position. Plutarco Elias Calles became president in 1924. In 1928, Calles left office and was not eligible for another term. However, he wasn't willing to give up power so easily. The new president and many other elected officials were loyal to Calles and continued to do his bidding. General Escobar decided that he needed to overthrow Calles and make himself president. On April 3, 1929, Escobar attacked Jimenez, hoping to overthrow the current government. He failed and escaped to the United States. Escobar returned to Mexico in 1942 and offered his services. He wanted to help his country achieve victory in World War II. Escobar returned to his military career and, after the war, remained in Mexico until his death in 1969. Battle of Blood Alley Crime was a serious problem in Sydney, Australia during the early 20th century. Gambling was mostly unregulated. Prostitution was allowed on the streets. Drugs were plentiful and readily available. This began to change in 1927. Laws were enacted to prohibit the sale of cocaine. Also, citizens could no longer own pistols without acquiring a license. This made it difficult for gangs to shoot each other. A sailor visited Sydney not long after these laws were passed. He was attacked and used a razor for self-defense. Local gangs decided this was a good idea. Razors were easy to purchase and were also easy to hide. Gang members could use them to intimidate, kill, or disfigure. The criminals that used these weapons were part of what became known as Razor Gangs. During the years these organizations were active, it is estimated at least 500 people were killed or maimed in Razor attacks. Two of the largest gangs in Sydney were run by women. Kate Lee and Tilly Devine were rivals. Their organizations made money from several illicit activities. Drug sales provided much of their income. 
One of the drug lords began putting boracic acid in his cocaine supply. Drug dealers discovered this, and eventually it became known to Kate and Tilly as well. Each woman blamed the other, making a gang war inevitable. On May 7, 1929, the Battle of Blood Alley began in an area of Sydney known as King's Cross. The two gangs clashed in the street and began beating and slashing each other without mercy. It happened again on August 8, 1929. This conflict became known as the Battle of Kellett Street. Gang violence continued until 1935. Authorities finally convinced Kate and Tilly to reach an agreement. The pair were given the choice to make peace or go to prison. The Gulag System Vladimir Lenin created a system of forced labor camps in the Soviet Union. After his death in 1924, Joseph Stalin inherited this legacy. Rather than eliminate the camps, he worked on expanding them. On June 27, 1929, the Communist Party created the Gulag. This was an agency responsible for administration of the forced labor camps. These camps were supposed to become self-supporting, and they were going to replace prisons in the Soviet Union. Joseph Stalin had reasons for doing this. Cruelty was one of them. He was also trying to find ways to settle more remote and harsh areas of the Soviet Union. Using prisoners to settle these regions seemed like a good allocation of resources. At the same time, Stalin was enforcing collectivization on citizens. Poor peasants were arrested and sent to prison camps. However, Stalin wanted to eliminate the Kulaks. These were peasants who owned land. Within just four months, more than 60,000 people were sent to the forced labor camps. Conditions at these camps were incredibly harsh. Prisoners frequently starved to death. Those who did survive were never given enough food. Illness and hunger were constant companions for those lucky enough to survive the punishment. Anyone who could escape did so. In the 1930s, the government tried to solve this by recruiting spies within the camps. They also created ambushes along the most popular escape routes. The forced labor camps never provided new settlements or helped the economy in any way. Ultimately, they were a drain on Soviet resources. In 1941, the population in the camps reached its peak at 1.5 million prisoners. This was slowly reduced over the next decade. After Stalin's death in 1953, the Gulag system was finally eliminated. SS San Juan Accidents at sea were a common and unfortunate feature of the 1920s. The San Juan was built in Pennsylvania in 1882. For the first several years of its existence, the ship was used to deliver mail between the United States and Panama. Before meeting its untimely end, the ship would have an eventful lifetime of service. In 1895, the San Juan was nearby when a passenger steamship began sinking. That disaster killed 100 people. A crew of the San Juan rescued some of the survivors. In 1905, the aging steamship was caught in a storm. The engine was damaged and the vessel nearly capsized. Eventually, it arrived in San Francisco for repairs. In 1910, San Juan collided with another steamship. Because it happened while the ships were docked, the damage was minimal. In 1925, the ship was sold to another company. The new owners wanted to transport passengers along the west coast of the United States. The San Juan was old and had no luxuries, but it could operate cheaply. Middle-class travelers made use of this affordable travel option. On August 29, 1929, the ship departed San Francisco. There were 119 passengers on board. Later that evening, thick fog began moving in. A little before midnight, San Juan was hit by an oil tanker. Only three minutes after being hit, the steamship slipped beneath the surface of the ocean. Some of the survivors were helped onto the oil tanker. A few made it to lifeboats. The rest 
waited in the ocean for rescue. 77 people died in the accident, 42 were recovered. News of the accident caused outrage. Members of the public thought that the government shouldn't be letting 47-year-old steamships carry passengers. The government claimed the age of the ship had nothing to do with the accident. Eventually, new laws were passed to help improve safety standards, but it was too little too late. The Great Depression destroyed shipping along the West Coast and as airplanes and cars became more common, ships were no longer used to carry passengers along the coasts. The Young Plan At the end of the First World War, Germany was required to pay reparations. Under the original agreement, Germany was required to pay $132 billion to its adversaries. However, by 1924, it was obvious that the country would not or could not meet its obligation. The committee which oversaw these reparations decided to create a new plan. Owen D. Young was one of those tasked with fixing the problem. Previously, he was founder of the Radio Corporation of America. He had also been involved with creating the first reparations plan. J.P. Morgan Jr. was also part of the effort. Morgan was a prominent banker, having inherited a fortune from his father. The new proposal, known as the Young Plan, reduced Germany's burden to $112 billion. It also created a banking system which would help with meeting these financial obligations. The Young Plan was finalized and accepted on August 31, 1929. Before it could be enacted, the Wall Street Crash of 1929 happened. The United States had to reclaim money from Europe, which was originally going to help implement the Young Plan. Germany continued to pay a portion of the reparations annually until Hitler rose to power. After 1933, payments on the war debt stopped. Economic hardship caused by the reparations helped the Nazi party come to power. Germany's debt obligations resumed after World War II. The final payment was made in 2010. Teapot Dome Scandal Albert Bacon Fall was born in Frankfort, Kentucky on November 26, 1861. At the age of 11, he began working in a cotton factory. It caused respiratory issues which plagued Albert the rest of his life. He moved west, hoping to find a better climate. On May 7, 1883, he settled down in Clarksville, Texas. He married and had four children. Albert and his family would soon relocate to Las Cruces, New Mexico. Oliver M. Lee was Albert's neighbor and friend. Oliver was known for using violence to terrorize his enemies. Albert used his skills as a lawyer to make sure Oliver didn't face punishment for these crimes. Albert Jennings Fountain was an attorney in New Mexico. Fountain publicly challenged Albert Fall and fought him in court all the time. On February 1, 1896, Fountain and his son disappeared near White Sands, New Mexico. Oliver was suspected of killing them. He was put on trial for murder. Albert Fall made sure to defend his friend from these charges. Ultimately, Oliver was found not guilty. Albert was skilled at defending accused murderers. In addition to helping Oliver, he also represented Jesse Wayne Brazel. In 1908, Jesse confessed to killing former Sheriff Pat Garrett. Pat Garrett was famous for killing Billy the Kid in 1881. Albert convinced a jury to find Jesse not guilty. In 1912, Albert would be elected to the United States Senate. He would remain there for nearly a decade. In March 1921, Albert was offered a position in the Warren G. Harding administration. Albert Fall became Secretary of the Interior. He then took over responsibility of the Naval Oil Reserves in Teapot Dome, Wyoming. Albert ignored the bidding process and gave his friends leases to drill in these locations. Albert's friends also paid him handsomely for this gift. 
Warren G. Harding died in office on August 2, 1923. Investigators soon realized the extent of corruption in his cabinet. Albert B. Fall was convicted of bribery on October 25, 1929. He became the first U.S. cabinet official to be sentenced to prison. He served a one-year sentence. His political career was ruined. Albert Fall retired to El Paso, Texas. He passed away on November 30, 1944. Our exploration of the 1920s is now complete. Over the course of this series, we have covered 60 different events, and yet it's only a small fraction of the troubling history from this decade. What decade should we cover next? Let us know in the comments. Your opinion matters. And really, how often does someone say that to you and really mean it? If you found this episode interesting, please hit the like button. Subscribe to our channel so that you don't miss our future episodes. If you want to make sure we keep providing this strange community service, please consider becoming a patron. You can also make a one-time donation if the thought of commitment disturbs you. We even have some merchandise on our website. Look for links in the video description. Thank you for watching Bad Things in History.